Ladies and gentlemen, would you give a huge round of applause for Ian Livingston. Thank you very much. Good morning. I'm uh, delighted to be here. What a lovely part of the world. Um, I'm going to here to take you on a bit of a life journey by why I found uh, being in the games industry so compelling, how I turned my hobby of playing games into making games, and how I think games exemplifies the connection with children like no other entertainment medium, and how we can use games in a very positive way to engage with children and turn them from being consumers of technology into creators of technology. When we enter this world as children, clearly these aren't my children, um, we, it, we play. Uh, play is natural. We interact with the world and we learn through discovery. As we get older, we enjoy solving puzzles, uh, we're problem-solving animals. And when we attach rules to games, to puzzles, they become games. I joined the games industry not long after chess was invented in 643 AD. And um, with two old school friends, uh, Steve Jackson, John Peake, and me on the far side, the, the, the handsome guy on the far side. And we started a company called Games Workshop um, in a flat in Shepherd's Bush. And back in those days, there was no games in per se. And even though Dungeons and Dragons looked um, pretty dull, really a white box with sort of very minimalist illustration on it, it opened the whole world of your imagination. Here was a game which is a role-playing game. Hands up anyone who's actually played Dungeons and Dragons. Okay, good. So you know the, the, the joy of, of exploring worlds, killing monsters, finding treasure, taking on the roles of heroes and wizards and clerics and going these incredible adventures of the mind. Um, it was very difficult to raise money back in the day. But so we, Steve and I went over to the States, signed up all the fledgling games companies, um, got to meet the great man himself, Gary Gygax, uh, with the white shirt. Um, those people in that photograph there was Fritz Lieber, science fiction author, then Gary, Professor Bach, who invented another game called Empire of the Petal Thrower, myself holding the boxes, Rob Coots, who wrote a lot of the games um, for Dungeons and Dragons, and Steve Jackson looking a bit odd at the front. Uh, the worrying thing about this particular photo is the three guys to my right are all dead, and I'm next in line, but um, I'm delighted still to be here. We also got to meet Miss Wisconsin 1976. I don't know what she's doing, but I'm enjoying myself here. So we came back. Um, started selling uh, Dungeons & Dragons through uh, mail order and um, we thought this is a great opportunity to, to expand, to, to determine our own destiny. So we went to the bank manager and said, we've got this great game, it's a role-playing game, it's, uh, you kill monsters, you, you find treasure. And he looked at you rather like a, a, an Alsatian watching television and uh, kind of urged, you out, out, urged us out of his office. And I think that's, that still maintains today that sort of inability of the investment community to understand uh, entertainment content, uh, digital entertainment content, and games in particular. So we were obliged to live in a van for three months. Uh, it wasn't this van, but one very similar, affectionately known as Van Morrison. And, um, and that was just kind of terrible, the fact that it's so impossible to raise money for, for new ideas. And the creative industry has always suffered uh, a perception of being fluffy industries run by lovies, even though we create some incredible intellectual property. And one thing that worries me, particularly in the UK, is that it, those people who create content, the IP creators, often have to trade away their IP in return for project finance. And it'd be so much better if they went further down the value chain of ownership and make sure that it doesn't suddenly get bought and owned overseas so we can get further taxation from retaining the IP in this country. Through us unable to get Dungeons and Dragons into other retail shops, we decided to open our own first retail shop, and I'm hoping to do a, an Apple photo reunion one day. So if any of you are in the queue, please let me know. Um, this was in April 1978, but if you go to it today, it's now the Bosnian Herzegovina <laughs> Community Advice Center. So we might have to do a little bit with Photoshop if you're trying to do that reunion photograph. Um, workshop was also famous for creating Warhammer. And going back to the IP point, which I always tell lots of children and students these days, if you can retain ownership of your IP, you build real value in your own company. Now, Dungeons & Dragons wasn't ours. We only had it for three years, so we replaced Dungeons & Dragons with Warhammer. 
So workshop, I'm no longer associated with the company, continues to do well, over 300 stores, um, publicly quoted company, all, all's well there. One thing Steve and I took out of that learning from role-playing games is how to connect with, with, with children uh, on a, <clears throat> in, a, in a ways that they don't normally connect. So ordinary books, Passive, it's a passive experience of reading, reading a, a linear narrative. There's no real engagement other than the imagination with the reader. Now, we came up with the interactive game book idea. Um, this was a book in you, the reader, were, were the hero. It was a, a branching narrative with a game system attached. So you could call it analog hypertext. And these were very engaging for children because they made all the decisions, whether to turn left, turn right, you find a key in one room, you have to open a door further down the, p the passage going on. So it was effectively the gamification of literature. And they sold some 17 million copies around the world. They were very successful, got reluctant readers to read. Um, you'd think that uh, everyone would be very happy with that, but no. Uh, the Evangelical Alliance published an eight-page warning guide about our book saying that um, if children interacted with ghouls and demons, that they're going to be possessed by the devil. A worried housewife in deepest suburbia said that having read one of her, her, my books, her son levitated. Um, so the children thought, one pound fifty, I can fly, we'll have some of that. <laughs> and uh, a local vicar in, in Penguin, near Penguin Books threatened to chain himself to the front gates until the books were banned. Of course, I'd like to thank them all for the incredible public relations because um, Puffin didn't do much public relations themselves, so thank you to them. But history is not being kind to games. Back in the 1850s, um, Scientific American rallied against uh, chess, saying it's basically a waste of your time. And when it comes to video games, the media tends to go into an apoplectic frenzy when talking about games, uh, thinking that all children's minds are going to be permanently damaged by playing any game. Um, I got into the video games industry um, first by designing a game in the 1980s for a small company, which we put four development companies together and created Nuco, IDOS PLC, which we floated on London Stock Exchange in 1995, and IDOS probably most famous for, for, for Tomb Raider. And this is another example of how great we are at the creative industries, how, how we can turn what started off as a simple sketch into a multi-billion dollar franchise and how, to, how would you actually try and raise finance on the back of this, this particular sketch. Um, Tomb Raider went on to become uh, over 30 million copies sold, um, one of the most uh, successful games franchises in, in the world, it became a pop culture phenomenon gracing the magazines of not just games magazines but also uh, <coughs> cultural magazines. So I'm just going to take you on a small journey of the history of the video games industry. It started off uh, really as, uh, in the 1960s. A space war was a, a simulation of two warring spaceships with limited fuel, uh, just hacking it out in, in, in space. But this was never commercialized. It wasn't until the 19, early 1970s when Nolan and Bushnell uh, launched Pong and the Atari company. And this, this for me, um, exemplifies what's good about games. When people ask me what's the most three important things about creating a game, I will say gameplay, gameplay, gameplay. Technology and art plays a supporting role. This was clearly not sold in its art. Um, games entered the homes in the late 70s with the Atari 2600. Some 40% of the American population were playing games back in the day. Uh, the Japanese, never wishing to miss out on opportunity, dominated the arcades in the late 70s with games like Space Invaders. And, and asteroids, and I'm just going to take you on a small sort of uh, journey for any games players out there to enjoy the, the early days of the games.
It's hard to believe that it's nearly 20 years ago since Lara Croft first started bumping into doorways and killing endangered species. Um, today, of course, there are a multitude of, of games platforms, something for everybody, there's content diversity, new next-gen consoles creating interactive cinematic experiences, um, these huge Hollywood-style productions. And so games has moved from a niche to a mainstream audience. Um, children play games, as we all know. Young people play games. Old people like me still play games. Everybody's playing games, and that's really good to see. So games has moved to a sort of mass market um, entertainment system. You only have to look on public transport. The number of people are playing games on their smartphones. And we're now living in what's called the planter of the apps. In, the, in Asia, for example, 80% of the revenue on smartphones comes from, from games. There are millions of people watching games as spectator sport. Even though the world doesn't know it, you get crowds of up to 100,000 people watching large screens of people playing games. There are 100 million people regularly watching uh, games through Twitch TV. Big business. Games is now going to be worth $100 billion a year in software sales alone, and yet it goes largely unnoticed. But besides the great business opportunities and career opportunities, I'm going to talk about the careers and skills in a few minutes. I just want to talk about how I see games as being a force for good. Clearly, they're social. We're sitting in the living room playing with friends. Games are recognized now as a genuine art form. Uh, the cultural impact of games is well known. BAFTA celebrates games like it does with film and television. Games can be used as, as a motivational for, for people with uh, rehabilitation. Um, can be used as a training school, a tool for training pilots and surgeons, obviously, in a safe environment. Games require you to solve problems. You cannot get through a game without solving problems. Games give you continuous assessment. You're not marked six months after the event in the exam. You, the game immediately tells you how well you're doing or not how well you're doing. Games allow you to build cities, manage resources, game like Roller Coaster Tycoon. We're actually building a theme park, understanding the economics and consequences of your actions, running it like a mini economy. Games like Civilization, where you're taking charge of whole world events. Games are very creative. Any parents here with children who play Minecraft can see the value of digital creativity when these children are building huge architectural 3D worlds and sharing them with their friends. It's a very wonderful hands-on learning by doing creative activity. So if you can park your prejudice against one of two titles that people always talk about in the headlines and think cognitively what's happening when you're playing a game, the problem-solving aspect, the community, the creativity, the intuitive learning, the trial and error, you can fail in a safe environment, I would argue that games are actually a very good thing for our children to do. But of course, you have to take a balance in life. If anything that's done at the exclusion of everything else is clearly not a good thing. So as responsible parents, you have to make sure that children don't spend too long playing games, but you can still argue that they're a good thing. So it's a question of hands-on, minds-on. And the point I'm really getting to is how we turn our children from enjoying playing games to wanting to make their own games. Because we, we know that we need so many more people involved with digital creativity. And games are the kind of flagship for resonating with children from turning their play, playing into making games. So it's not as easy as you think. There's a multidisciplinary approach to making games. It's all these technology, art, animation, 3D programming, 2D programming, artificial intelligence, physics, maths, narrative, camera, speech, lighting, mood. There's a huge multifaceted um, production studio. So sometimes, so a game like Tomb Raider, some 200 people are involved as huge teams taking two or three years to make games. But the other end of the spectrum, small teams, two or three man teams can make incredible content, serving them to digital audiences via super high speed broadbands. So small teams can do big things in the world of games. Um, <clears throat> during my uh, career in, in making games, uh, I also chaired Creative Skill Sets Video Game Skills Council. And we mapped out every university in the country that had the word games in them. Now, 144 courses had that. And out of those 144 courses, we were only able to accredit 10 of them in the first six years that I was chair. 
And the problem was these courses were masquerading as giving students the ability to be able to start work straight away. In fact, what they were doing was teaching them soft skills. These were basically media study courses with the word media crossed out and games inserted. What we needed were courses that gave children, uh, students hard skills like programming, coding, art, animation, so they could actually start work rather than having to be retrained with skills that actually needed for their careers. So I went to Ed Vasey, uh, our culture minister, who's been a great supporter of the creative industries and the video games industry in particular. And he tasked Alex Hope and I, who was the CEO of uh, Double Negative, uh, the largest, one of the largest visual effects companies in, in, the, in the country, with writing a review. And we had fantastic uh, help from uh, Nesta, um, who not only funded um, the report, but also conducted seven Ipsos Modi st studies, and we made a film, and we had two great researchers, in Hassan Bakshi and Juan Macias Garcia. And we realized it wasn't just about the games or the visual in effects industries. It wasn't about uh, using technology. It was turning the, our great nation of consumers into creators of technology. And the way ICT was taught in schools was largely about consumption rather than creativity. So we really had a, a junction point uh, from Douglas Rushkoff's book, do we direct technology or do we allow ourselves to be directed by it? Are we going to sit in the passenger seat or in the driver's seat of the next generation of technology? Everything we know, as you of course know, is touched by technology, whether it's a car, whether it's fighting cybercrime. We need people who can code. If you think what happens in a digital minute, you know, millions of Google searches, uh, number of Twitters, tweets posted, um, the number of views on Facebook. Not only is it the creativity part, how are we as a nation going to create the next Googles, Facebooks, and Twitters right here in this country? We're certainly creative enough. We're certainly able to understand high technology. Games came about of our understanding of creativity and, and high technology. So in NextGen, we looked at the whole talent pipeline, started off at universities, and realized that the problem that less and less children were applying to study computer science at university was because of the narrowness through how which ICT was taught at schools. Back in the day, um, children were learning how to compute, but ICT had narrowed down to a strange hybrid of office skills. Against all odds, and the fact that children were using their smartphones and everything they do in their lives, their shared activities, the way they communicate, yet against all odds of them loving their iPhones, they were bored to death and they were through the narrowness through which ICT was taught. They were being given Word, Excel, and PowerPoint as a way to, to build their futures in ICT. And there was no, root, no wonder that children were not wanting to do it. So I'm now going to show you the 10 minutes of uh, the film we made um, to, in support of, of NextGen. It's a very powerful message, so bear with me. I think all the special effects are made in America. I think all the big video games we've made in China, Japan. Special effects and things are usually, don't usually do them out of this country, places like New Zealand. Video games are probably made in Silicon Valley around San Francisco. America. China. Japan. Japan. America and Japan. America. New Zealand. Japan. San Francisco. <laughs> now I think we've come an age where we can actually be proud of what we're doing because we are creating great content which is culturally, socially and economically important to this country. In a digital age, schools and universities are failing the creative industries. There are a few shining examples of best practice. What we want to try and do with this report is make those shining examples the norm.
One such example of best practice is a primary school in Girvan on the west coast of Scotland, where pupils are learning a whole host of creative and technical skills whilst making their very own video games. I made the biker follow a path, but Kodu has to stay off that path so he doesn't bump into the biker. I've made a game with a factory with bikers coming out and then I'm a, I'm a jet and I'm trying to reach that star. This games design project wouldn't have been possible if it wasn't for forward-thinking teachers like Avril Denton. I think Kodu is more motivational when teaching a lot of these skills, problem-solving skills, math skills, language skills, it motivates them. Problem-solving, puzzle-solving, choice and consequence, intuitive learning, management, simulations, social aspects and even dexterity. They are a great thing. They're coming here and they're learning how to create games and they can then go home and create games or play their own games. You feel really special that that's your game being played by different people. I would like to make games for people to buy them all over the world. It's opened their eyes really because the children have realised that you know this is a job that they could do and they're, they're starting at a very early level but they could see right I could, I could go on and do this for a living. This is Sackboy. He's a familiar icon of the digital age to millions. He's the star of Little Big Planet, a game which enables anyone to create a world of their own. He sums up the creative power of video games, even for the youngest players. Little Big Planet has been recognised with countless industry awards, including several BAFTAs. Technical director Alex Evans and creative director Mark Healy put their success down to an eclectic mix of artists and programmers working side by side. Traditionally, you divide it into code, art and design. We decided that the more people we could hire who could do two things in those kind of categories, the better. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, you can program, but you're an artist. Yeah. Um, I can't draw, but I wish I could. And so there isn't really a sense of awareness that you're in different jobs. You, you have slightly different strengths. Alex's path into the games industry was something he pursued off his own back. He believes that if he'd had the opportunity to make the most of his passion in computing at school, it could have transformed his entire educational experience. The partitions between subjects are quite strong, and um, I wish someone had said, yeah, you're allowed to use your computer to write music for your music GCSE. To me as a child, that would have been awesome, because for me, programming and learning graphics and uh, all the stuff I ended up using in my in industry was stuff I did at home, away from school. Secondary schools don't seem very aware of this kind of thing at all. I mean, I think they're very like, you go and do English, you go and do history, like quite kind of traditional. It would have been helpful if I'd known that I could have taken my hobby to a different level at that point. I think they need to understand that you can do art and technical and be successful at the same time. What we would love to see is more people understanding that that means that from the very earliest stage of education, art and sciences go together. Group learning goes with that because that's part of how we work in industry. What we're trying to achieve with this report is to create a culture where that is understood, encouraged and incentivized right the way across the education system. An educational establishment steeped in tradition, Merchant Taylor's Independent School for Boys is famous for its high academic standards in subjects like classics and history. But the school recognises the importance of teaching programming to meet the needs of careers of the 21st century. We have many children for whom computing is a passion, it's a hobby, it's as relevant to today's children as stamp collecting or chess was to a previous generation. If you look at the applications that have conquered the world in the last decade, Google, Facebook, Twitter, they've come from the combination of computer programming skills with creativity. It's by turning out children with that sort of versatility, rooted in traditional academic values, but who are applying those values in a new, technologically-based society. But as Kim Blake from Blitz Game Studio stresses, the computer programming that industry wants to see taught in schools is very different from traditional teaching of ICT. These are people who are on Facebook at the age of 10. They don't need to spend a year learning how to use Excel. What they need are people who will teach them how to program, how to draw, how to use this technology. 
really, really well, and that will give us the sort of creative brilliance that the UK is capable of. Learning about Word, Excel and PowerPoint is not going to get you a career in the high-tech creative industries. The sooner that parents, teachers, pupils realise that, the better chance this country has to build on the firm foundations that we've established. What we want is for people to learn about computer programming. It's something that children absolutely enjoy, computer programming. It's a creative computing. They can build games, they can learn from playing games, they can make games together. It's a shared experience and something they can feel very proud of and it prepares them for real life. I love programming a lot. As I've started off with Scratch. What we learn at school gives us a general idea of what we, need to, what we will need to know for the future. The digital world is changing in front of our eyes. And with it, new careers are opening up, requiring new combinations of skills. It's that combination of art, which allows you to go beyond what is there, and maths, which helps you understand what is there, that is absolutely crucial. In our work, we're simulating how buildings collapse, which is physics, we're understanding how rivers flow, computational fluid dynamics. They all work together. We wrap science and art together at every turn, every minute of our working day. For our work on 2012, we were dealing with simulations, uh, pyroclastic ash clouds sort of flooding into the scene, uh, lava bombs crashing down, having huge impacts on the environment. But the technical skills behind those require you know, strong sort of maths, they require strong computer skills and to make it all look good once you've accomplished the technical tasks um, you generally need to have a good eye. My dream graduate would be somebody with maths, physics and art. Sadly there are very few of them. So hence our number one recommendation for Next Gen was to have computer science and the school's national curriculum as an essential discipline. And that's so important. Um, if we want to attract companies from overseas to invest in our country, to provide jobs, we attract them with financial incentives, which is economically important to them, but at the same time, we have to give them a skilled workforce. We cannot build a digital economy with a nation of digital illiterates. So it's so important that we turn our consumption into creativity, because this is nothing new. Back in the 80s, the BBC Micro was the cornerstone of computing in schools, and in the homes, everybody had a Sinclair Spectrum for 100 pounds, an affordable, programmable computer. So when NextGen came out in, in 2011, um, the great fear, because it had been commissioned by Advasey, from who was from Department for Culture, Media and Sport, they become another dust collector. But being a sort of dogged uh, northerner, I wasn't going to let that happen. So I went to try to get into the Department for Education and was turned away at the door saying that Ofsted said that ICT as taught was perfectly fine. Well, that's all very well saying your candles were okay, but if the rest of the world is going with light bulbs, that's not so good. So we formed the Next Gen Skills Coalition, uh, funded by Yuki, the, uh, the Games Trade Association, and um, got a lot of like-minded people and some heavyweights, including Facebook, Google, and Twitter. And I um, was delighted when Eric Schmidt, the chairman of Google, uh, referenced Next Gen in his Matt Taggart lecture in 2011. And he said that he was flabbergasted to learn that computer science wasn't taught as a standard in, uh, in, in UK schools. And of course, if Eric said it, it must be true. And uh, the Prime Minister echoed his words a month later in Tech City, saying, yes, we're not doing right enough to, to help computer science in schools. And that led uh, us being able to meet with the then Secretary of State for Education, Michael Gove. Not always Mr. Popular, but I think for this, he should be really praised for his um, decision to disapply the existing ICT curriculum and replace it with a new computing curriculum. So computing is right here, right now. And it's like we're really at the starting point. It's on the curriculum, but what are we going to do next? We're going to aim for the moon. We've got to make sure that it doesn't explode on takeoff. So who is going to meet the challenge? 
well, not the Department for Education, they quite rightly step back, saying they're not able or equipped to deal with it. So it's up to us as practitioners, as educators, to help the next generation of children and teachers to understand how to go forward into the digital creative part, which is so important and so vital to all our businesses today. So what exactly is computer science? A lot of people are confused by it. They don't know how to teach it because they don't really know what it is. But it really is a, is a discipline. It's a way of thinking more than anything else. It's computational thinking, algorithms, and code as well. And it's, but it's not just about computers. As Edgar Dijkstra said, computer science is no more about computers than astronomy is about telescopes. The computers are a tool for enabling creativity to happen in the digital world. So if Latin underpinned the analog world, I'd argue that computer science underpins the digital world. And, and as I say, it's not just about coding. Um, code Unplugged is a great example of what computer science is, and coding is here. An algorithm is just really a set of instructions, whether it's to a computer or to somebody. The poor chap who was, had locked-in syndrome was able to write a book by creating a code between himself and the transcriber, and they optimized the alphabet so the most recurring letters were put to the front of the alphabet. So just being able to wink he was able to write a whole book, and that's just through optimizing the code. They actually do say that poets make the best coders because they know how to optimize the language most efficiently. So who is going to teach the teachers? Well, computing at school, uh, part of British Computer Society are doing their best. They're being given two million pounds by the department to become centers of excellence in their local areas. But we should also look to the children to teach the teachers. We cannot limit the children by the knowledge of the, of the teachers. And if they don't feel able to do it, they can quite easily become a facilitator. There's always going to be one child who knows more about it than they can do. And they can have a group learning experience. They can hack their knowledge together. They can introduce code clubs into, into the school. And they, together, they can collaborate and create and, and, and content in the digital world. The resources everywhere just go along beyond the four walls of the classroom. There's an incredible amount of free online resources from MIT where you can get Scratch, the great initiative this year from, from the BBC with its Make It Digital uh, initiative. Um, the BBC are going to give a million of their micro bits away to every year seven child in the country. That's going to be like an entry-level um, computer. Now, of course, some of them will be sold on eBay or hit with a hammer or thrown in a river. It doesn't matter. The net output of the children being able to do some digital creativity, a result of having a, a BBC micro, micro bit, is going to be fantastic. We need to get more women in technology. It's so important that we teach computing and coding at a very early age um, to get the excitement of the creative component. It's not just about making databases by the long beers for IT systems. It's, we've got to be able to show the creative component of computer science. And that really comes to what is education for today. The world is changing before our very eyes. As Richard Riley said way back in 2000, that we have to prepare children for jobs that don't yet exist rather than keep training them for jobs that will no longer exist. And that's why I've put forward an initiative to, open, uh, to apply to open my own free school because uh, I'm so worried um, that a lot of the sort of Victorian attitudes still exist in the classroom today, learning by rote, being tested their memory six months down the line, whether or not they get it right is often arbitrary. Because children of today are different. Every child is born into, different, born into the internet behaves in a different way. They are a connected generation. You have to see the way they operate, the way they share everything, their privacy, their creativity. They naturally collaborate. Collaboration for them is not cheating. It's how they, they behave naturally. And three great Einstein quotes. It's the only thing that interferes with my learning is my education. Education is not just learning of facts, but the training of minds to think. We have to, of course, recognize that knowledge is very important. We have to commit to memory, literacy, and numeracy. Of course we do. But at the same time, we have to get children to become problem solvers. They're only going to get through a life that's changing exponentially by technology by being able to problem solve and to be able to communicate. Communication is a key skill that's often not taught. And we have to make learning more playful. We, I said at the onset that learning through play when you're engaged is a very natural and resonant way of, of learning. 
And collaboration is the way children work together. So why can't they collaborate in school? Not everybody is going to be an academic. So whilst it's important, of course, for children to learn to read, why do we force Shakespeare in them at such an early age? Even though my books were pilloried by the establishment at the time, we got a whole generation of children reading because they were engaged in that lit reading process. It was all about their story. And that's made them want to create their own stories. They enjoyed the problem-solving aspect. They enjoy being the challenges. They enjoy being participation. And if you get children to participate in the learning experience, it's going to have a much more resonant impact on their learning. Not all of us academics. Again, the way maths is taught, for me, is sometimes upside down. Conrad Wolfram, who's talking here today, will tell you more about this than I do, because he's a brilliant mathematician, is that we tend to have focus on the computational bit of maths in the classroom. Even though we have these devices that can do the computational bit, what the children need to know is when and how and where to use a quadratic equation. Now, you're all a very bright audience. Hands up, anybody who can do this. That's three of you. Um, and yet, we require our children to carry on doing this. They can do it at the time. Six months later, they've forgotten. They don't even know why they said it in the first place. So let's try and make maths more relevant for children who would naturally want to learn. They're naturally curious. Yet we do our very best to suck that creativity, to suck that diversity, to suck that free thinking out of them in schools. We're not all academics. Art. We revere the people, the commentators. I'm going to do History of Art of Cambridge. Oh, you must be a very intelligent person. Your opinion is so important. You must have to have three A's to go to Cambridge to do the History of Art. Oh, you can paint, can you? Well, you only need to do it in E. And by the way, um, we don't really value what you say. So I'd like to see more kudos given to vocational skills, more kudos given to skills. Qualifications, great. Commentators, great, but let's have an equal status for practitioners and for skills. Let's recognize the power of the imagination. Let's get kids to make things do stuff. So in the digital world, get them to make an app. Get them to build a website. Maybe make a game. Maybe do something robotics with a Raspberry Pi. If they're involved in learning and through self-learning, they're engaged. And let's not have this siloed approach to education. Let's join arts and sciences together. By joining arts and sciences together, we get that wonder, which is the creative thing. And we are such a creative nation. Look at our film, our fashion, our music, our publishing, our architecture, our games. It's a revered around the world. It gives us an edge as a nation. So let's not try and strip out that creative component from the classroom. It worries me that we're so concerned with standardized testing. It's as though we're using children as guinea pigs to assess schools for the league tables rather than whether they're learning themselves. Of course, STEM subjects are important. Science, technology, engineering, maths are vital. But never, ever compromise the arts and what that can do for child's imaginations, their diverse thinking, self-expression, self-determination. That's the wonder that gives them their individuality. I don't know if you saw last week the maths question that went viral. As though as everyone's ever going to go into a sweet shop and ask for n squared minus n minus 90. Sweets, please. Um, we've got to do more to make learning relevant. And let's not punish children for making mistakes. Failure is just success work in progress. Let's not make them feel bad for making mistakes. That's what life's all about. Let's celebrate our differences. Testing people against the same metrics all the time, to my mind, is wrong. Together, we can do great things. So if the answer to this question was going to push down the tree, of course, the elephant wins. So let's look at our, the way we assess children. There has to be a better way. And the last thing about learning about coding and creativity is that in the analog world, so much of that world is already won and lost. But in the digital world, any child, no matter how disadvantaged, can crowdfund an idea, he or she can reach a global audience through super high-speed broadband with an idea, an expressive idea that they can monetize. 
maybe they can become a job maker, not just a job seeker, if we give them the right skills, the right opportunity to become digital entrepreneurs of the future. Um, they're not all going to become Mark Zuckerberg, of course, but even a small digital agency or anything could add to UK PLC, and I hope they can do it. Um, for me, life's been a game. <laughs> I hope to carry on making games, and uh, that's it. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you.